Well, uh, the excitement of seeing uh, the man land on the moon. Uh, and uh, of course, the more important in the part that I was more involved in is the launch vehicle. So the actual launch of, uh, of Apollo uh, 11 uh, at the Cape, that, that I will never forget that. And uh, then uh, the long period of waiting uh, to while they were on the en route to the moon to see how everything was going to go, and then the final touchdown on the moon. Uh, of course, we all had confidence it would happen, but uh, it was a great relief to see it happen. Uh, I was at the Cape at the time of the launch, uh, of course, because we were involved very heavily in the launch vehicle. I was in the there's two control rooms there, and they have the, the control room where the people are on the consoles, and I was in an adjoining control room uh, where we were readily available for consultation at that time. So I was there when the, when the Apollo 11 was launched, and uh, that was a big thrill. Of course, we'd seen earlier Saturn's launch, but there was nothing like the one that was supposed to go to the moon. So. Uh, you know, I came home uh, after that. Uh, actually, our mission was complete once uh, the, we were injected into orbit and, and on into the lunar trajectory, translunar trajectory. But uh, there was a lot of long hours and days of waiting to be sure that everybody else's system worked because we, uh, of course, were not responsible here at Marshall, nor was I responsible for the actual landing system. So uh, I was at home watching it on TV when the actual landing occurred. And there were a lot of people that wanted to be uh, in somewhere for a party and whatever, but I was, I didn't feel, I was still too concerned. I wanted to be alone with my family. Yeah. Frankly, that was a great relief, great jubilation when it happened, but uh, nothing compared to when they actually landed back on the Earth. You know, there was still that concern even uh, while they were on the moon, it was always the nagging concern, is everything going to work to get them back? So. Well, the mission was there, the goal uh, clearly established, and uh, we all had confidence in ourselves. Uh, there was a lot of work that led up to the actual development of the Saturn V. It certainly wasn't something that you just made the big step and launched off on uh, developing that launch vehicle. We were already the team was already in place here even before NASA in that uh, as a part of ABMA we were already working on a precursor to the Saturn launch vehicle and we were using the systems we had developed for the Army, specifically the Jupiter and the Redstone missiles. And if you look at the uh, Saturn One stage that you see on display at the museum, you see a cluster of smaller tanks around a large one. That's really a bunch of redstones clustered around a Jupiter, and that's the way we started. We, we perfected the redstone, taking it one step at a time, and then the, the Jupiter, and then when we got the charter from the Advanced Research Projects Agency before NASA to, to already start on a large launch vehicle, we, we took that technology, which was very simple and crude compared to what we have today. Things were much simpler back then. We Digital computers were almost non-existent, and uh, so we did everything in a, in a simpler way than, uh, than we now do things, uh, like on the shuttle program. But uh, it was uh, a team that was built up over a number of years, and uh, we all knew each other and had confidence in each other and had a good uh, working relationship. And, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the thing that held it all together was Dr. Von Braun and everybody's uh, respect for him. And uh, he was truly a team leader. And we really worked as a team. We had, uh, and you were on the cutting edge of uh, technology, you were doing things that never been done before. But uh, even though you didn't have the experience, if you ran into a problem, you could always be sure that there was some specialist within the center that had a technical background that could help you get through that and solve that problem. So it was working, uh, it really was a team effort. You hear about the Von Braun team, that's just, that's not just a phrase, that's a, a fact. That's the way it worked. And uh, we all, uh, you know, the lines of organization were maybe not as clearly drawn as some people like to see them. And, uh, you know, you, you try to explain how the organization worked, it's sort of difficult, but uh, 
it's because we knew each other and respected each other and uh, worked together. And uh, and if there was ever problems, you know, we knew the guy at the top, uh, Dr. Von Brown, uh, would step in and make a decision if there was a difference of technical opinion. And everybody respected his his judgment. I mean, uh, all the way from minor things to very major things. So it was a uh, it was truly a team effort uh, involving a lot of specializations. Well, he was, I guess he was probably a genius. He was a great communicator, but he was technically very astute, and he had been interested in space from very early childhood, essentially, and had such a tremendous background personally from his uh, experience, even as a teenager and on into his 20s uh, before he uh, got seriously into the, the missile business and the space business. And he was uh, such a, a magnetic personality and he always made you feel a part of things. He uh, never put anybody down. I never saw him uh, chastise anyone publicly. I'm sure he may have called some people in privately on occasion, but uh, it was always, uh, he, it was, he was an easy man to follow and an easy man to respect. And uh, he made you feel like you were part of things and that your opinion counted. Even from the very, I remember I came here in 52 and I'd only been here three days and was working in the back of uh, an old warehouse, 4481, uh, on a helium leak detector with a technician and all of a sudden here shows up Von Brown. I'd been here three days and this was such a remote area I didn't think I would see him for months and uh, he showed up with my lab director wanting to see what what we were working on and he and the lab director were in some difference of opinion about this technical application of this device so he turns to me and asks me what is my opinion and that was something I, I noticed from from that very first event all the way through the Saturn Apollo program, he had uh, he would always call you in if you were present for a meeting where a significant decision was being made. He would go around the room and ask, "Well, what is your opinion?" And he he would uh, whether you were sitting, you were front line or sitting at the table, or whether you were sitting in the back of the room. He would always look around and get try to get the draw the opinions out of uh, of everybody and be sure that that everyone felt they were part of things. So. I think that's the key to it. He was truly a team leader. He was a leader and uh, that everyone respected and uh, he had that innate technical capability of uh, understanding enough about all disciplines that he could, he could explain it. He'd come through the lab and uh, ask you a few questions about some intricate device you're working on and uh, a few weeks later, he'd come through and explain in detail that same device to a visitor. He, he comprehended things well enough to, and he could put things in terms that the layman could understand. And I think that was part of his great value, not only communicator with internal within Marshall and NASA, but his ability to communicate with Congress. I mean, he was highly respected because he could put things in terms that the layman uh, or the politicians could understand. So he was an invaluable asset from that standpoint, just on his personality. Well, I was responsible for, at that time, for the uh, instrument unit, uh, which incorporated all of the guidance and control, instrumentation, communication, computer systems, and also the control actuators that are in, up and down the, the stages of Saturn. Uh, I had been involved in uh, the development earlier of the control systems and then became responsible for the total system before the actual landing. Uh, that was in 1968 uh, when I became the director of the Astronautics Laboratory, which had, I had the responsibility for the total instrument unit. Well, the instrument unit uh, was built here, uh, it was focused here in Huntsville. We, uh, realized from the outset that we uh, that this was going to be a very complex job to bring together essentially the, the total brains of the Saturn uh, V vehicle and that it would be desirable to have it very closely under control of, of the local 
Marshall Group because we had already done a great deal of the uh, conceptualization of how the system would work. So the plan was to bring a contractor to Huntsville who, uh, who would have the, the background to do this. And this would not be a typical aerospace company. It would not be a Boeing or McDonnell Douglas or company that would normally build the, the structure uh, and the propulsion system. So uh, we, Dr. Von Braun decided we should select a company that, that had the in-depth technical capability in the electronic field, uh, in the electrical field, and uh, we selected IBM, and a small group of us, I well remember, went to IBM and, uh, and looked at their situation there at Owego to see if they had the kind of capability we were looking at, and, and we decided that IBM was certainly a good, good choice for that system where the emphasis would be not on the, even though this is a piece of the structure, the importance of it is the the things that are inside that structure, and it's uh, just chock full of electrical, electronic, and electromechanical systems. So, uh, Dr. Von Braun uh, convinced IBM that they should actually set up a facility here in Huntsville. He was a very persuasive man, and uh, whether they really that was necessarily in their best uh, business interest or not. They they certainly agreed to do it, and they moved a group here and uh, and set up uh, the group that that actually implemented the uh, the uh, instrument unit design. Of course, the elements of the instrument unit uh, were built by a number of different contractors. It it is the brains of the vehicle. It has the stabilized platform with the accelerometers and gyros that that give you the information of uh, what your angle is, uh, attitude angle, and your position in flight, and it has the, uh, the, the key part of the instrument unit, the heart of it, uh, would be the, the computer, which was a triple modular computer, and that was designed and built by IBM, and that was one of the reasons for selecting them, but that was the most complex piece of the, of the instrument unit, and uh, we evolved this technique together with IBM to build a computer that even with failures, uh, you could still continue. And that's what we call a triple modular redundant. It could sustain several failures and, uh, and would continue to operate. Uh, so that developing that computer and the software that went with it, as well as all the peripheral systems that uh, the input sensors, gyros, rate gyros, accelerometers, angle of attack sensors, all that information goes into that computer and then the information that comes out uh, commands the uh, control actuators on the stage. There's a network that goes up and down the total vehicle to command the control actuators that gimbal the engines. But all of that was concentrated here along with the instrumentation, the power systems, the batteries, everything to be integrated right here in Huntsville, and uh, that worked out uh, very well. We uh, didn't have any failures of, of that system that uh, even even this triple modular redundancy we had in that flight computer, there never was a single flight failure. So we, even though in that sense we over-designed in, in a sense uh, that we had, but that was the most complex part of the system and we felt that uh, we had to have that uh, capability. But it was, it is the brains of the system, and uh, keeping it under very close control and close scrutiny here, where the all the system engineering was done, was a key part of uh, the success of the program. Well, it certainly was a tremendous achievement, and I think it was, uh, it was just based on a focus of a goal that was set. It was. New, new technology, and it certainly was a, a major achievement. And the fact that, that this program was carried out without any flight casualties is, is a very phenomenal thing when you think of the thousands and even hundreds of thousands of, uh, of parts that had to work. And uh, even though we used uh, techniques, uh, redundancy techniques, so if you had a failure, one failure, some other system would, uh, would back up uh, one that had failed, that was certainly not universal. There are many, many, many single failure points in, uh, in the Saturn V vehicle, and the fact that that vehicle could be
constructed and tested in a manner that, that you could actually accomplish these missions uh, with no flight fatalities. Of course, there was the one unfortunate incident on the, on the pad, and that was back when we had a full oxygen atmosphere and a spark, electrical spark, had actually ignited it, and so we had to go back and restructure, reassess, and come up with a less dangerous approach there. But uh, just uh, the fact that all of that happened and, uh, and that we really did it without any human fatalities, I think, is phenomenal. It's really uh, one of the greatest achievements that I've, certainly the greatest achievement I've ever witnessed, and I would say you could go back uh, centuries and probably not find anything uh, parallel to it.